So today we're going to be looking at the upper classes and how they're depicted in uh, regular sort of print uh, for, for people. One of the things that I think is important uh, to look at in this class, right, we've been looking at a lot of history, uh, we looked at the, the rise of the Industrial Revolution, we've looked at um, uh, sort of how do we define this period, the problems of, of sort of equity uh, and the sort of the look back of history and how a lot of people view this period as a great period. But I also, when I was developing this course, I was really interested in the ideas of the literature of the period. One of the things that I'm really fascinated about the Victorian era and, and the growing literacy, which we've already looked at because of skills and, and other items, is the writer, the larger readership that develops here. And more importantly, the growing um, ability of sort of common people to really engage with, with new types uh, of literature and experiences. And that's why I wanted to focus on today and then the next lecture on, on literary aspects of the Victorian period. So that's what we're turning our attention to today. So today we're gonna to be looking at the upper classes, uh, the upper class, the aristocracy, and Jane Austen. Uh, so many of you, I am sure, have heard of Jane Austen, and most of you probably have read at least one book of hers uh, over the course of your education. So obviously, I think most of us are aware that Britain is and always has been, or at least for a very long time, has been a monarchy. And we know that Queen Elizabeth II is the Queen of Great Britain, and we know that her ancestry, going back to Queen Victoria, the topic uh, of sort of this, this summer's course, is obviously part of her lineage. However, what's important to realize here is that because of the monarchy, there are other titles included here. And the upper classes, the aristocracy is part of that. So who are these families? And this will sort of sound familiar to you uh, from a previous lecture. All right, so the aristocrats and the upper class are families that draw their money from the land. These are bad. these are titles that are given to people historically, at least, and this is certainly not true uh, any longer. But these are groups of people who earn their money through renting out land. These are people who have earned their titles uh, typically through through their connection to the monarchy, which we'll get to in just a second. And they rent out their money, they rent out their land and collect money from, from this. They are often looking, they often look down upon the new moneyed class. And obviously in the 19th century, as industrialization is creating <clears throat> greater, greater sources of wealth and different types of wealth, right? Land is becoming less of an important aspect because of new scientific farming methods, because of more, um, let's call it industrial farming. Land is becoming less of a valuable resource. And instead, value is being put into things like factories and machinery and coal mines. And those industries are making it such that all people, whoever, you know, whoever owns those can become fabulously wealthy and, and risk and, and could indeed become as wealthy, if not wealthier, than this landed aristocracy. As we'll see, this obviously means that this group of people, this aristocratic landed gentry, will be looking down upon the people who are sort of the new money. Um... These are often also hereditary titles. So by that third point entitled to keep land in the family, these are hereditary titles, meaning that a father passes his title to his son. And this would be a situation in which um, fathers pass the titles to their sons. Uh, the the women here are, 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 are basically, uh, you know, uh, accessories to to the family uh, the sort of land and money stays within the male line and there are very distinct roles for men and for women men are uh, 
obviously uh, men are the business people they are the ones overseeing the industry it is women are are you know the the realm of domesticity where when we think about items in the past or per, certainly our, our previous uh, discussion right in middle classes or in or lower classes, women were producers. They had to be, right? They they would often hold jobs, maybe making being a seamstress of some sort, some sort of factory labor, uh, home care of some sort. That would not be the case for the upper class, right? There would be for the aristocrats, it would be sort of unseemly for a woman to be involved uh, in any sort of employment. And that would not be, you know, that would, that would be sort of realms of domesticity, realms of, of distinction. So who are these members of this upper class, right? Uh, the titles are passed down from the, el from the father to the eldest son. And if there is no eldest son, uh, this would be turned to a, another nearest relative. And for those of you who read the excerpt of Jane Austen posted uh, with this video, that chapter that I gave you, and it's very short, and I understand it's out of context, but it shows us a couple of really important aspects, right? The Bennets, this sort of, and if those of you who read the larger book, the Bennets are this landed aristocratic class who are concerned about what's going to happen to the family homestead, right? And Mr. Collins is a distant cousin who is writing to Mr. Bennett saying, uh, you know, I want to meet you and I want to settle old wounds before I become a member of this class, right? And and what's important there is you see the family sort of asking two really important questions. One is, who is this guy, right? He's uh, He just gets to come in here and kick us out of our home. Uh, and that's one of the questions that's asked early on in that chapter. But the other question I think that's really important being asked is, you know, why why must he be able to keep us out of the home right and there's this exchange on the third page where that question is being encountered now again these are these are sort of long held traditions but but by the night you know and not that these questions weren't asked earlier but by the 19th century women are producing in factories women are doing really good work and and being breadwinners for families and the question is becoming well, why must we lose our right to inheritance? So the titles that are associated with um, with the nobility are dukes, marquis, earls, barons, and viscounts. Uh, the orders the with in which they they sort of come are, um, you know, you are ennobled by. You're made a, a, a noble, right? So when you become, if you do something of great honor, of great value to the crown, to the country, uh, to your community, you can become, you are made a, a baron in some way. You are made an, uh, a noble in some way. Obviously, you have to start at the bottom and work your way up. Uh, but in other ways, you are sort of given, you can be given titles, right? And this is kind of a ridiculous example, but you might remember uh, when Prince Harry uh, married Meghan Markle or when Prince William married uh, Catherine, Kate, right? Um, the queen, as a wedding gift, gave uh, gave a dukedom, gave a, a duchy to, um, to the couple as a wedding gift. Now, I'm not entirely sure if that entitles them to rents. I'm probably going to guess not in the 21st century, but historically it would have um you know prince charles is entitled um as the duke of cornwall he's allowed to get rents from there um so all of these things you know provide wealth back to the family and that would have been the same that would have happened here most titles uh could never be uh inherited by women they had to be inherited by a male heir so this would be ways for um, other men to become noble, right? Um, and this way for, for inheritance to sort of float out of the family. Uh, there's an interesting thing here too, right? Um, I, one thing that was which, which should be talked about, right? Noble families by the 19th century are losing their prestige. Uh, land is land value is decreasing. So what did a lot of them do? They married into industrial families. So a famous family, Churchill, right? Winston Churchill's family, Winston Churchill's father, uh, who was a noble, 
uh, wind up marrying a, a wealthy American journalism uh, heir, right? So she had her own money that she was able to inject into the family, uh, the aristocratic family, so that they could sort of keep more money flowing in. So Jane Austen, I'm sure many of you have noticed before, right? Jane Austen has a very short life. Uh, she lives for about for 41 years. And she's just about the, you know, the brink of this period. But she brings in a lot of the sort of themes that are going to be important to the, the Victorian era. Her, her most famous books are Pride and Prejudice, Sense and Sensibility, and Emma. But she really pokes fun at the, 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 her time, right? She is asking questions that are valuable to it. And I, and I talked about those already. But she also really talks about the sort of changing role of women. And in many ways, her own existence um, does that, right? One of the things that's important to see, and in the reading for for this lecture, you noticed, I hope, is that she is she herself is perceived as bucking the system. Uh, the fact that she is seen as writing for others, right, is, is kind of seen as as a way that she is not conforming to the role of women of her day. But in another perspective, right. Um, she was seen as just sort of writing for her own good, a woman who is, uh, who didn't mean her books to become public, right? These were just sort of the, the, the trivial writings of a woman. It's also important to notice that she never gets married, right? Um, she stays single throughout her life. And, and for a person who is trying to buck the system, right, that's an important thing to notice. Austin in her books focuses on the strong role of women. Um, they ask major, she asks major questions. She is satirical, right? And that whole exchange, as I discussed a moment ago about Collins and, you know, how he is becoming a noble uh, is part of that. And then the women, as right? But she's also, Austin is also taking on a role of significance by really taking on that increased readership, right, that increased literacy that had become important in the late 18th and into the 19th and certainly through the 19th century. There are women's magazines that are portraying Austin in both favorable and unfavorable light. But, but it's important to see here that all of these, these different readerships and, and the magazines that are discussed for today are are illustrating those you know those new readerships that are emerging that people are starting to encounter different styles of reading and and magazines that are specifically put out there for women now most of those read those magazines would have a conservative bent who would certainly not be favorable towards jane austen's readership and and, and authorship but it's important to see that though that that all of them are sort of doing the same thing, right? They're they are focusing on these different, um, these new readers, if you will. Finally, the last thing to talk about is that there are changing roles of women in the upper classes and, and across the board, right? Late, and this is certainly true in the later Victorian period, certainly after the 1860s, that there's a shift in, in, in rights towards women, right? Um, society is now forming to advocate for women so that there's something called the women's protective and provident society and this is a way for this is a group that's encouraging women to to go into unions uh to protect their own labor right uh give them their own um sort of right to work where they can gain uh more access to to, to collective bargaining and, and the like the important thing here, though, is that the Trade Union Congress uh, starts to represent women in 1877. So who is the Trade Union Congress? So the Trade Union Congress is um, a, tr a trade union organization, as the name would suggest, where all trade unions are represented, right? So if you are a shipbuilder or a, a crane operator or a miner or a weaver or whatever the case might be, your union is represented by the Trade Union Congress. And they start representing women in the late 17, uh, 1870s, right? Again, it's shifting to, to more focus towards women. 
There's also huge legal advantages given to women in the late 1800s, right? The, the Married Women's Property Act gives women the right to, to keep the money they earn, right? As they are earning more money in factories and in different industries, they are keeping that money uh, that they had previously would have had to forfeit or surrender to their husbands. This also gives them a, a, a more substantial right to inheritance. Again, significant changes for the women in the 1800s. There's also the first sort of welcoming of women into the vote, right? Again, there's there's criteria here, but it's, it gives women who are paying taxes, so they have to be the people who own the property, of course, but if they're paying taxes, they get to vote in local elections, right? So this is not national elections, but this might be for sort of local council people and things like that. Again, small steps, but important steps. So the aristocracy and the upper classes are certainly important here, and they are being represented by Jane Austen in her novels. In the, in the excerpts of Pride and Prejudice, you can see the substantial changes that are happening in the women's work and women's roles, and the questions that are being asked about why women are not being accepted. But it's also obviously showing us the sort of class problems that are going on, right? Uh, there are these questions about Mr. Collins and the questions about aristocracy. So, good luck.